We started out with syphilis's model, and that we used to call uh, the syphilis spirochete, sneaky Pete the spirochete. Uh, is he in heaven? Is he in hell? That damned elusive pimpernel, you know. Uh, the uh, syphilis spirochete could outwit the immune system in many, many ways. Uh, and it could go inside of cells and hide inside of cells. Uh, it could uh, hide in areas of the body which we call sanctuary sites where the immune system doesn't get to very easily, like it hides in brain, because brain is a sanctuary site. It hides in the eye, because the eye is a protected site, and the immune system doesn't get into the eye and the inside of the eye. And there are other areas of the body where these sanctuary sites exist. Remember when we were fighting the Vietnam War, there were sanctuary sites outside of Vietnam in the adjacent Asian countries where the Viet Cong would hide and we would have military activity inside the borders of Vietnam. We couldn't get to the sanctuary sites because they were outside of Vietnam. Same, same concept. So hiding inside cells, hiding in sanctuary sites, two ways. There's a third way that is now coming into four, and that is actually cloaking of the spirochete with molecules that include parts of the normal human molecular blood structure called complement proteins. And they found that uh, a key component of the uh, outer proteins of Borrelia spirochetes, OSPE, can combine with factor H, which is a complement protein, and create a product, a combined product, which then sits on the top of the spirochete and cloaks it, hides it, conceals it. So the immune system goes right over it and misses it because it thinks it's dealing with complement, which is its own protein. It says, oh, that's my protein complement. That's not a bad protein. I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to invade that. I'm not going to take that out. So if it were a drone, right, flying through your bloodstream, it would look down and see something that it recognizes as friendly, which is your own complement. So the spirochete can co-opt complement. It can also cloak itself in what's called an immune complex, where your antibodies wrap around pieces of the spirochete that are in the bloodstream and form a complex like this. And the spirochete is in the empty spaces and the antibodies are my fingers. And my fingers are wrapped around the spirochete inside or the spirochetal protein such that the body only sees the antibodies which they know are human and friendly. But the bad guy is hiding inside the immune complex. So in order to get to the truth, you have to break it open. And that work has been done very, very well by Dr. Stephen Schutzer at the University of Medicine and Dentistry uh, and uh, colleagues at Stony Brook, including Dr. Pat Coyle. So uh, there are many, many wrinkles in hiding, many, many wrinkles in evasion, and many, many wrinkles in uh, you know, survival of what we call persisters. The ultimate survival mechanism is the biofilm. And what is a biofilm? Biofilm is different from a single microbe. It's a community of microbes. And the community of microbes are specialized. So you have well, the equivalent of carpenters, electricians, accountants, uh, you know, uh, sanitary engineers. And all these Specialized members of the community have specialized functions which are different from the single microbe which started the community growing. And they surround this community with a protective layer of what's called extracellular matrix. It's a protective layer of material that includes DNA from the bug, proteins that came from the bugs that were once living but are now dead, and they form a glue that holds the community together. The community is serviced by its own waste removal system. It has canals, water canals, so uh, nutrients can flow in and uh, waste can flow out. It has its own communication system. It has both nanowires, like electrical wires or telephone wires. It has nanotubes. And uh, these are all methods where the community members communicate with one another and they know what's going on on the East 40 or on the West 40 or in the central area of the community, and they all know what's going on in every area of the community in every moment. And so this is a very sophisticated system of microbe cellular organization which evades the immune response and uh, 
promotes survival and promotes chronic infection. The microscope work that I did in the 80s uh, was again heavily based on the green monster which is the syphilis model. So with syphilis we knew that syphilis could exist in a spiral form which is like a corkscrew. Syphilis could exist in a granular form which is like salt and pepper flakes but the spirochete has actually been chopped up into little pieces or little sausages that are then chopped up into smaller and smaller pieces and each of them take, takes DNA with them. So the little pieces, even though they're not the entire long corkscrew, can reform the entire spirochete. So we have spiral forms, we have granular forms, we have uh, liposome forms, which you alluded to, uh, they're also called blebs, but liposome is a correct scientific terminology or micro vesicles, those are little forms that pinch off. So if I were to pinch my skin like this and raise up an area and then actually have this detach from my skin and separate and stream off into the bloodstream, that would be a liposome form. And inside that would be some DNA from the bug and a coating of my outer tissue, which in this case is skin, wrapping around it. So it looks like it's human. And uh, then there are forms that are larger like uh, balloons uh, or soap bubbles that have no cell wall. Uh, and they're very uh, much like uh, the cell, uh, cell free uh, L forms that were for first described in the Lister Institute. They have no cell wall and they can assume a variety of shapes. And finally there are my favorite, the cystic forms or the round bodies. And those are spirochetes that round up uh, just like you'd circle the wagons in the Old West, they round up into a uh, sphere and the uh, worm-like elements of spirochete are inside the sphere and you see them like a, a ball of uh, worms or uh, cotton uh, in a ball of yarn. And then over time, these uh, continue to exist. They can open up and they can reform the modal spirochete again. I think of the spirochete that moves which is a corkscrew form, as analogous to the male factor, which is the spermatozoan, which has a tail, which moves it, and it has DNA. And its function is to move DNA from the male factor to the female factor. And then once it reaches its goal, it drops the tail. It doesn't need it anymore. And the DNA and the egg fertilized becomes a new human being. So uh, motility is not necessary, movement is not necessary, spiral form is not necessary. There are other forms that are actually uh, straightened forms that are mutant forms and they look like uh, this ballpoint pen. And under the microscope, inexperienced people with a microscope would look and say that's a straight form of a bacteria that's not Borrelia because it's not a spiral, it's not a corkscrew. Well, in many cases they're wrong because this mutant is straight because it's lost its flagelli. Flagelli are little ropes like guy wires that are connected to little motors and the motors pull on the, the wires and then those, that pulling action promotes rotation, promotes forward movement, backward movement, twisting, breakage apart. All of the movement things are due to the flagelli. There are flagellin-less or flagellin-negative mutants of Borrelia burgdorferi that have been proven by alien studies by Dr. Alan Barber again, uh, who is a preeminent dean of, of American spirochetal microbiology as far as I'm concerned. Alan G. Barber, professor at the uh, University of California. Uh, and uh, he de de described this straightened form. No corkscrew, but Borrelia just the same. When the tick assaults, and he does assault, just like an enemy assaults, or a mugger assaults, the human body, the tick inserts its mouth part, which has barbs on it and looks like a harpoon, and pushes that through the skin. Now normally, uh, your skin has nerves that would make you aware of something going through your skin, and you'd feel pain or you'd feel itching. The uh, Borrelia has uh, um, chemicals in its saliva that neutralize this uh, sensation of pain or itching. So you're not aware of the bug being attached to your body. Uh, so that's the anesthetizing part. Then it starts to take a blood meal and uh, 
normally if something foreign contacts your blood, your blood clots. Your blood is protected from bad things happening by a clotting mechanism, very complicated. The Borrelia gets around the clotting system by making anticoagulants. So as long as it's foreign harpoon is inside your body and sucking your blood through your vessel, your blood doesn't clot. That's amazing. He has anticoagulant too. Not only does he have anesthesia like Novocaine, he has anticoagulant too. That's amazing. And he fills himself up and he looks like a swollen grape when he's, when he's finally finished. Some people will look at a, 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 an engorged tick, a, a fed, a repleted tick, we call them, and see a brown spot in their, in their skin and say, oh my God, I got malignant melanoma. It's brown, it wasn't there last time I looked and I think I have malignant melanoma. It's dark brown, it's on my skin. And then you look a little closer and say, but it has legs. It's an engorged tick. So I have to be carefully removed and get the mouth parts out. What else do we have? We have complement system. A complement system is a series of proteins whose mission statement is to punch holes in things and kill things that are foreign. So if you have a microbe and complement attacks it, the complement enzymes punch holes in the uh, uh, wall of the bacterium like a paper punch and the guts leak out. Next we have the ability of the bug to use its protein machinery to cloak itself and to conceal itself from the immune system. We've covered that before with the interaction with complement factor H and with the formation of the uh, immune complexes uh, which are shrouded and uh, surround the foreign material. Uh, the last is the uh, cytokine response. Cytokines are a broad family of uh, molecules that are produced by uh, white blood cells and uh, macrophages and other body, human body healthy cells in response to assaults and injury. And there are too many to mention. They all have letters and numbers. And so if I start reeling off letters and numbers, you're going to fall asleep. So I'm not going to go into naming them, but cytokines are a family of uh, proteins and active substances which promote and regulate the immune response to a bacterial infection. And cytokines are extremely important, for instance, in the production of the red rash around the tick bite site, just for an example. They're also important in the arthritis part of the infection or the heart irregularities due to inflammation, part of the infection, or the brain meningitis inflammation, worst headache you ever had, part of the infection. Cytokines play a role in all of these and other manifestations of Lyme disease. So those are the uh, uh, A through F uh, components of how spirochetes and ticks together cooperatively uh, get past the barriers and into the human and cause trouble. Dr. Eva Shapi is the one who came up with the idea, and I give her full credit, that Borrelia could exist as a biofilm community. Now, how radical was that idea? Well, if you consider that 99% plus of life uh, in the microbial world at some point in time will exist in a biofilm community, then why was Borrelia left out? We know that the spirochetes, which are corkscrews, have members like leptospires, which are biofilm formers. So that's proven from the Institut de Pasteur in Paris, France, excellent facility. Nobel Prize winners come out of the Institut de Pasteur. So Institute Pasteur. I visited the Institute Pasteur. It's a wonderful facility. Leptospires are biofilm formers. Oral treponemes, that's the oral spiral forms, not syphilis, but oral treponemal in your gum type spirochetes, produce biofilm communities. That's in the dental literature from the Forsyth Dental Center at Harvard, and it's established. So we have, of the members of spirochetes, we have leptospires, check, make Borrelia, uh, I mean, make uh, biofilms. Uh, Treponemes, check, make biofilms, Borrelia, why not? So we started to look. Now, even the idea of looking for a biofilm of Borrelia caused an intense political furor. Why? Because biofilm infections are, by definition, 
chronic infections all the time, every day. All biofilm infections are chronic. The CDC does not believe in chronic Borrelia and chronic Lyme disease. So our military uh, structure in the CDC does not believe that there is a chronic form of Lyme or chronic form of American Borrelia infection. So by even looking for biofilms in Borrelia, we're, we're, t we're taking on the CDC and saying, well, let's take a look and see if maybe, just maybe, remotely, it might. And over six years, we proved it did. Then the next battle was to prove with all of our controls and elaborate uh, pictures and using atomic force microscopy, which is a technique which has never ever been used to study any biofilm that's available here in Dr. Shapi's lab. Atomic force microscopy, can, in, in individual molecules can be visualized with atomic force microscopy. Incredible tool. She has atomic force images of Borrelia biofilms. All done, all published. 2012, we crossed the Rubicon, and uh, it is now out there in an academic journal called PLOS1, Dr. Eva Shapi, Biofilms, Borrelia, Reality. So Dr. Bill Cosserton, uh, who is the father of Biofilms and who sadly passed away last year, we miss him greatly, uh, instructed us that Biofilms are members, built of members which are specialized, so that each of the bugs is not a cookie cutter of the neighbor next to it or across the street or down the block from it. And you have carpenters and electricians and sanitary engineers and all those specialization equivalents in a biofilm. It would be nice if you could look under the microscope and look at a biofilm and see that the members not only do different functions but actually look different shape difference in shape. Uh, one, one of the benefits of, of Borrelia is that it has a form that's spiral, has a form that's granular, has a form that's cell-wall deficient, has a form that's cystic, and has a form that's liposomal. We've already been through that. So we have five different potential shapes that a specialized Borrelia might assume. And it turns out that if you do the right spectral analysis, uh, high resolution, uh, image analysis of a biofilm of Borrelia, you will see that around the outside of the Borrelia, you'll see spiral forms. And as it matures, the forms, as they go deeper and deeper inside, become smaller and smaller and more granular and more liposomal. And so at the center, you're not going to see spirals anymore. Spirals are at the outside. And the other more specialized forms, the cystic forms, the granular forms, the liposomal forms, the cell wall uh, deficient forms, and the mutant forms, which is the straight form, are in the interior of the biofilm. And there are water channels, of course, that enable nutrition to go back and forth or waste to go out, as we, as we have described before. That's part of biofilm structure. Why does one area of the body get hit and another area of the body not get hit by a Borrelia infection? And that's tissue tropisms in infectious disease. Alan McDonald 101, year 1979, when I came out of my residency. That's why I went into my research. Tissue tropisms in infectious disease. Now, we know they happen. We know that it's multi-dimensional, multifactorial. It's very complicated. Uh, we know that uh, some bugs will uh, usually seek out the throat, let's say strep will seek out the throat and it won't seek out uh, the brain. Uh, we know that other infections will seek out the brain like uh, the uh, West Nile virus which causes encephalitis now in almost 50 states. It started here on Long Island, you know, ignored by the CDC and uh, well, now it's in 50 states and it's causing deaths in the West Coast too. So that causes brain as a tropism for brain. You don't have a rash, a Lyme rash, with a West Nile virus. Now, there are now 100 genotypes of Borrelia burgdorferi known to be existing in the United States. 
last month or so, we found strain 101. And what's strain 101? Borrelia miyamotoi. That's a Japanese name, discovered in Japan, uh, worked up uh, with science in Japan, and causing public health problems in Japan. We thought it was a Japanese problem, cross-specific, until the New England Journal of Medicine came out with an article showing encephalitis, meningoencephalitis, in a human in New Jersey due to Borrelia, not Bergdorferi, but Miyamotoi. Miyamotoi is a relapsing fever group Borrelia, which is separate, a separate compartment from a Bergdorferi group Borrelia. There's no blood test for Miyamotoi. It was picked up by a very smart laboratory technician, technologist, technologist, who had a good eye and used his microscope well and saw the spirochetes in the spinal fluid. No blood test. Now, with no blood test, we don't know how long it's been here. It could have been here for as long as we've had Borrelia burgdorferi here. We just didn't know that it was here. And we are constantly discovering new strains of Borrelia around the world that we never knew existed. And some of those have new names, like Lusitania, like the, you know, the ship that went down, Lusitania, or the Besetti in Czechoslovakia. Some wild and crazy Borrelia in Czechoslovakia, right? Two really swinging spirochetes. Um, Valsania. Uh, some Australian strains that really don't have names yet, but are different. And Australia has many, many different things because it's a continent where evolution has proceeded according to its own drummer. So we don't have kangaroos here. We have kangaroos in Australia. They have their own Borrelia in Australia. And uh, in South Africa, I think there's Borrelia too because it's an ecosystem just like the United States except it's south of the equator. Beautiful country. In Brazil, they have Borrelia. In Mexico, they have Borrelia. They have two strains. They have a European strain, Gorinii, and they have the American strain, Bergdorferi. And they coexist. So you travel to uh, Mexico on vacation, you can get bitten by a tick in Mexico, come back with a Mexican variety of Lyme disease. If you've got the Bergdorferi type, you're lucky because the blood test has a chance of picking it up. If you've got the European Gorinii type from Mexican travel, you're out of luck if you're testing with US test reagents. So it gets very complicated and we are a society that's more travel oriented and uh, we are going to be traveling to different ecosystems and bringing back infections from those ecosystems which are less understood here than they are at the site where you acquire the infection. And uh, we're, Ill, we're ill prepared to deal with international travel medicine in many, many medical communities. Worldwide, there are probably uh, 150, maybe more, genotypes. That doesn't mean Latin names like Bergdorferi, Gorinii, Afzelii, but you would have Bergdorferi 123 and uh, Bergdorferi 297 and uh, Afzelii AN345. There are naming systems that involve the Latin name and then letters and numbers afterwards to designate individual strains. All that material is contained in freely accessible files on the internet uh, and the National uh, Center for uh, Bioinformation, NCBI. Uh, so you can go to their website and look on uh, the, uh, the site for microbes, uh, Borrelia, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, Borrelia uh, can be grouped into sensu stricto, S-E-N-S-U, S-T-R-I-C-T-O. That's uh, what we would think of as USA Borrelia. And then Borrelia sensu latu, which is an amalgamation of USA Borrelia and European Borrelia and other Borrelia. So there's ways of, of slicing the cake so that you can make it a little easier to manage because you have all this data and you're awash in this tsunami of data and, and different genotypes and different mutants and, and, and it becomes overwhelming very fast. Uh, but the important thing is that if you are looking for a specific uh, Borrelia that is unusual or is not well represented 
or is not represented at all in your community because they got the infection in Europe, then you are better served with a European manufactured Borrelia test kit. The same thing applies to babesiosis. Babesiosis is uh, one of those malaria-like things that is transmitted by the same tick that transmits Lyme disease or Borrelia burgdorferi. On the East Coast, we have Microti babesia. On the West Coast, we have Duncani babesia. If you are testing the blood, you can look for antibodies to the babesia, but you must use a Microti test kit for East Coast Microti infections. It won't pick up the West Coast Duncani. And if you're looking for Duncani, you must use a Duncani manufactured test kit because it will not be picked up by the Microti. And there's European strains of Babesia and there's a Missouri strain of Babesia. So it's, it's not just that we're talking about the special case of Borrelia being picky. We're talking about basic sound principles of medicine that we use in blood banking all the time. If you're looking for a specific antibody that is gonna interfere with blood transfusion being success or failure, you have to have a specific red cell in the library which enables you to detect antibodies to that unusual protein on the potential donor blood. It's a basic pre premise of laboratory medicine that you must have test kits which are appropriate for the analytical process that you're attempting to do by testing patient blood. It's just as basic as ABC. Unfortunately, the rule makers are not board certified hospital pathologists, certified in anatomic and clinical pathology. The rule makers are by and large either infectious disease physicians who are not specifically trained the way laboratory experts in pathology are trained or rheumatologists who are joint specialists. And those are the rule makers, by and large, for the IDSA. There was a pathologist member of the IDSA, that's the Infectious Disease Society of America, and his name was Paul DeRay. He was a wonderful, wonderful pathologist. He too passed away like Bill Costerton. Last year we lost him. And he was a wealth of information about Borrelia and Borrelia science. And uh, he was the only person with laboratory credentials of a hospital pathologist to advise the rule makers on correct policy and correctness in using laboratory analysis to help diagnose Borrelia infection. Now there's nobody. Now there are just the guys who read medical textbooks and never read a laboratory textbook. And I'm sorry to have to say that, but we need to have pathologists who are trained in laboratory medicine to assist in developing better guidelines and revising the CDC guidelines. And I would even say radically that we should take all of the Borrelia test kits in the United States and discard them and start from scratch with the newer strains of Borrelia and develop new validations and use multiple strains in developing a better test kit and developing better libraries and incorporating the European proteins into the test kit or using three different test kits like they do in Europe to have a broader net to capture the ones, the patients, the poor patients who have proteins on their Borrelia that don't match the B31 from the tick that never saw a human, otherwise known as B31 test kits a miserable example of a mass-produced technology which does not serve patients and does not serve science or medicine. And I'm sorry I have to say that.